so hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. All good, Edouard? Yes. Thank you for coming to this session about uh, caching and GraphQL. Uh, my name is Martin, and today I'm here with Benoit. Hello, Benoit. Hi, I'm Benoit. I, I work at uh, Apollo with Martin uh, as, a, yeah. as, a, as an Android developer. So we, we share a, a project and we share a mic as well. So we will try to do it as uh, smooth as possible. Uh, we are, uh, bo both of us are, are working on this project here uh, named Apollo Kotlin. Uh, Apollo Kotlin is um, a GraphQL client written 100% in Kotlin. But today we want to talk about GraphQL and caching. Really, caching is one of the main pain points that we have heard uh, developers have with GraphQL. And we really wanted to make a, a, a specific session about this. If you don't know about anything about GraphQL, this is fine too. GraphQL is a query language uh, invented by Facebook that allows you to define and run your APIs. So GraphQL has a lot of uh, interesting properties. For an example, there is a, a complete type system in, in, um, in GraphQL. So you have a schema including all the usual types like uh, scalar types, uh, object interfaces. You can do the full poly polymorphic dance if you want in GraphQL. List and obviously uh, nullability, which is, uh, appeals a lot to the Kotlin developer that I am. Like you have nullability built in in your backend, so you know for sure when you're using a field in your UI if it's null or non null. It has a lot of other properties like introspection, deprecation, and all, all this kind of stuff. But maybe the easiest way to think about it is to compare it to a regular uh, REST API. So if you use REST, you have a JSON, you have an endpoint, you do a HTTP GET, you get a JSON back. And uh, if you're a company like Facebook in 2012, you do this for your desktop website. You also do this for your laptop, for your mobile phone, for your tablet, maybe a smartwatch. So every time you want a new app, uh, you create new endpoints. And this scales really, really badly. Uh, if you have ever been in a position where um, you are missing a field in your API and just maybe one single field, and uh, you had to file a Jira ticket for your backend team to actually implement the ticket and then wait a couple of weeks uh, for this to come in production, well, GraphQL solves this, and it does so by exposing the full graph. So uh, really, it does so, yes, no? <laughs> it doesn't do so. Yes, it does. Uh, so I don't know, maybe the picture was too big. Uh, but the base promise of GraphQL is that uh, you expose the full graph, and you can query any field, uh, you don't need to um, ask any backend developer. You can, like, this is really a very simple, simple graph. If you took the Facebook graph, it's certainly going to be a lot way more complex. But in this simple graph, you can visualize, and everything you see here, you can query. And when you query this, you get the data you queried and only the data you queried. Um, how does it look in practice, though? So here we have uh, the syntax for, for a query in, uh, in GraphQL. You can see that it looks a bit like JSON, except you only have the, the keys. And in fact, that's, that's what you do uh, in a query in a GraphQL, is that you list the fields you're interested in. And if uh, one of these fields is, uh, is of a complex type, you list the fields for this one, and so on, uh, recursively. It's like a, a bit of a tree uh, structure. And um, here is the here's an example of a of a response. So this here is, there's no no surprise. The syntax uh, it's a JSON just like in REST, and uh, maybe with a, a little difference is that the the data field here is uh, will always be present. It's part of the envelope that you will receive, and you could also have um, an errors um, field at the same level, which is also part of the of the spec, but one thing to to notice sorry uh is that um this kind of a um, mirror image here uh that you can notice and um that's because in uh, in graphql you you get the fields uh you get the fields that you request and only them and so here yeah, if i if i had a, a field or if i remove it you can see that it will be there or not and that's that's a um, fundamental uh, fundamental uh, difference with uh, rest and um, that has impact uh, with uh, caching 
And uh, yes, because we, we're here to, to talk about caching. And um, here we, we show like a, a common practice that we do to, to do caching on, on mobile is that you would use uh, something like a, a relational database and you would basically mm, cache your entities by, by mapping them to some tables. Um, so you have one table per entity, one, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I don't know, maybe there's a bad, a bad contact or something. All right. Uh, yeah, so one table per entity, uh, and for each table, you, you would have one column per field of that entity, and then, uh, yeah, uh, foreign keys to link all that together. And uh, you could use sometimes uh, like an, an ORM on top of that to help you, but usually you would do this mapping manually, like when you design your app. But the thing is, that doesn't really work well with uh, GraphQL, because as we said before, you don't really get the full entities uh, in your responses. You get only the field requests. And in this case, for instance, in this example, you have two queries that return the, the same entity, but with different uh, with different fields. So how would you do that? How would you do that with a with a relational uh, database that I showed before? It's not clear. Maybe you could you could consider that actually there are two different entities. Like you would do one uh, viewer table and one user table, but that's not really good because then you duplicate uh, data in your cache. Or you could say that all the columns in the table, they're nullable, and uh, then um, if you receive one uh, or not, it would be null or not, but that's not good either because then how do you differentiate when a field is actually null? So that doesn't really work. Um, another thing you could do is uh, instead, a cache uh, the HTTP responses, um, so the the JSON values uh, directly, and uh, in fact that's that could be a, a first a good first approach um, because um, it's easy to implement. It's also also uh, easy to reason about, but that's not really ideal either because, um, as you can see here, for instance, uh, I have two payloads that represent the same entity even the same with the same ID. And uh, if you use this approach, you would store them twice also. Um, so that's uh, sp space wasted on your cache. And also, if you would uh, refresh one of them, the other one wouldn't be refreshed. And so um, that would lead to, to cache misses, uh, which is exactly what you want to avoid uh, when you do caching. So. Martin, <laughs> what else? What else could we do? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> so, because in GraphQL everything is really dynamic, and uh, we cannot uh, tell in advance the shape of an entity, and all the entity might have nullable or present or absent field. What we do is something called cache normalization. And cache normalization is really the process of taking uh, your JSON response and tr transforming it in a list of records. And what I call a record, it's really a map of string any, don't scream yet. Uh, as a Kotlin developer, uh, this is very scary to see all these unsafe maps. Uh, really, it's like we're doing JavaScript, so wh wh why? why? But we will see later there's a very good reason for that. Um, if we take the simple example of uh, just one user, uh, what we do is we take this. So this is the JSON response, sorry. And we flatten everything. One of the record will have a data key here. And the other one we have 42 as an ID. Obviously, I'm cheating. There is an ID here. It's pretty important. And if I ever get a new JSON, 1212, yes. If I ever get a new JSON with a new field, because everything is flattened, I just store everything untyped in, inside my normalized cache. So everything is still unsafe and everything is, well, just any really. But the important thing is that we have ID. If we didn't have IDs, we would use the pass to the data. Yeah. Um, so if we didn't have ID, we would use something like data.user, which would 
mean something like this. Sorry. Um, I'm going to uh, skip forward a few slides. Uh, if we use the pass as ID, well, there is a bad consequence, which is that we duplicate a lot of data, and you end up in situation like this. I, I, I had a nice. <laughs> yeah. So if you use the pass as ID, you end up duplicating a lot of data. So really, uh, when you're using GraphQL, when you want to normalize a cache in GraphQL, it's very important that uh, you talk to your backend developers uh, to make sure that every entity has a stable ID. This is the first um, like takeaway from this session. Always define your IDs. And once you have this, you will have your full list of unsafe maps. Uh, stored uh, locally in your normal X cache. But this is fine, right? Yes. <laughs> this is fine because um, uh, if, you, if you do define your IDs, and even though, uh, as you just said, uh, uh, all the records are stored as um, unsafe, like untyped maps, uh, due to the nature, I mean, due to the built-in uh, uh, type safety of uh, of GraphQL and uh, all the type information that is in, in your... Uh, your schema of your particular API. Um, a library is able to reconstitute uh, from these records um, uh, strongly typed uh, uh, models. For instance, on, on the right, we have a, a data class, basically uh, a Kotlin data class. And um <coughs> yes, that's due to, to all the type safety that's, uh, that's in um, GraphQL. And in fact, uh, all of this is what uh, enables a powerful tooling uh, around GraphQL, and um, one such tool is uh, Apollo Kotlin. Uh, <laughs> what a surprise! So, yes, so Apollo Kotlin. Um, so yeah, as uh, as we said, uh, it's a uh, it's a GraphQL uh, client for Android and for any project uh, using Kotlin, and the way it works is that um, it generates code. Um, uh, it will take your queries and um, all the information in the in, in the schema, all the type information in the schema, it will generate uh, equivalent uh, models to your uh, queries and also uh, parsers that, uh, that basically uh, instantiate these models and fill them with, uh, with, uh, with the JSON payload and with the data that it's in uh, the JSON payloads. And um, one other thing that the library uh, provides um, as an optional um, dependency is an implementation of um, a normalized cache, as, a, as a explained by uh, Martin, basically an implementation as, uh, of a, what was uh, explained. And um, to use it, uh, it's easy. OK, so a bit of code. Uh, you declare your cache. Um, in this case, it's a memor in, in memory uh, a version of the cache. You set it uh, on your client, and from now on, any query you do uh, will go through the through the cache. And um, uh, okay, we also have a, a persistent version of this. It's called the uh, SQL because under the hood, it's using SQLite. But um, one thing to understand is that in fact, um, it's really an, an easy uh, uh, really a simple schema and uh, it's using uh, it's like uh, a key value store really so <coughs> so uh, yeah that's the persistent one and uh, in fact uh, you can also use both uh, by chaining them like this and um, that's like uh, yeah good for perf performance because if you do that uh, then um, you will uh, basically use the memory cache as much as possible, which is a very, very fast. And uh, then you would fall back to the SQL one uh, if you have a cache miss, and then fall back again to the network, of course, uh, if you have a, a cache miss there. And, um, but there's, uh, there's other cool things uh, you can do uh, once, you have a, once you have a cache uh, like this. <laughs> like for instance. Cool things. And at this point, I want really to pause a few minutes and um, go back to uh, a 
like the beginning. So we've seen what GraphQL is, uh, we've seen how it compares to REST, and we've seen that uh, we can, using very unsafe data structures, store everything uh, only once without deduplication using IDs. And Benoit just explained how with tooling we can take that unsafe um, representation and turn it into type safe models and how to really uh, set up and install your database. One, you, your, your normal S cache. Once you have everything set up, you can do really cool things like watchers. And uh, this is really the, the, the cool thing uh, you can do with a normal S cache is that you can use it as a source of truth for your whole UI. So instead of remembering whenever you change um, a value, you would just watch your wall cache and get notified when something changes. And something usually changes because you do a mutation. So a mutation is like post in REST, so it just means you're going to your backend and you're changing a value. Typical mutation would be something like this, um, saying, hey, uh, now I'm going to change the status of the user to say that I am at Android Makers. So if we take a, re a real life example of two coroutines, one of them displaying a UI and uh, watching the cache, getting the first value from the network and then watching the cache, it will first receive a first value, maybe at home or something like this. And then wait for cache updates. And then a second coroutine, it can be anywhere in your app, like any, any other component really remote or really close to where the first one is does the mutation, it receives the value from the network, and this value from the network, it's also going to contain this new value, saying the status of the user is now, hey, I'm Benoit, and I'm at Android Makers. The cache gets updated, and the first screen, or whatever UI component you had, uh, gets the update automatically. So if you look closely, this is really close to this diagram that you might have seen from the Jetpack Compose documentation. And this is um, a, a very nice and convenient way to make sure that your UI has a single unidirectional data flow and that is always con consistent. In conclusion, uh, GraphQL is a type safe language. It has a lot of tooling uh, that allows to build um, nice stuff. Uh, you can add support for offline with just one line. And if you are planning on using the normalized cache, make sure to include your IDs. Um, a few a few things to go to go further. So first of all. Um, here we listed uh, two issues um, that concern the, the normalized cache. Uh, don't hesitate to go there to have a look because uh, we're currently in the, in the design phase of this. So there's uh, yeah, stuff about uh, like expiring data in the cache and also specific stuff uh, about pagination. Yes, exactly. It's it's it's, uh, <laughs> it's issue numbers, but it's uh, it's to track uh, development of new features and. Um, and also, uh, okay, caching is not just for the client. So, uh, if you want to know about uh, caching uh, for GraphQL on the on the server side, there's uh, two the, like two keywords to to Google, I guess, uh, to know more uh, about this. And um, yeah, oh, so yes, for for inspiration to see uh, how all of this you could um, play with it, uh, you can have a look at the Android Makers app actually. Um, not the um, not the main branch, but uh, there's a specific GraphQL branch uh, that we worked on uh, recently uh, that shows a uh, yeah it's an example of an app uh, that uses a uh, GraphQL and the uh, and the normalized cache. And uh, yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, so we have office hours tomorrow if you have questions, and also now I don't know if we have time now for questions, but uh, you can <laughs> you can ask questions now uh, as well. And that's it.